this message. Excellent job. Bibles, the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 39 to 41. Matthew, chapter 26, verses 39 to 41. And after going a little farther, he fell face down and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, that is consistent with your will, let this cup pass from me yet not as I will but as you will and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter so you men could not stay awake and keep watch with me for one hour keep actively watching and praying that you may not come into temptation the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Now we are continuing our series on wisdom. Please be seated. On wisdom from the tabernacle of Moses. This is part two of the message, The Lord Speaks, with the focus being watch and pray. Watch and pray. We are continuing our series from the tabernacle of Moses where we have been talking about the seven keys for directional prayer. Our, our, our title being arrived at from the profound spiritual significance in the cardinal direction of the east which actually begins in Eden, symbolically stretching all the way to the tabernacle and the temple past and the temple that is to come prophetically future as detailed by the prophet Ezekiel. The entrances of them will be to the east. As we have focused on the significance of this eastern revelation, our third exegetical PowerPoint has led us to the significance of directional prayer. Directional prayer, which is the two-way communication with God that yields us answered prayers. And, and we're in a season where we need God to answer our prayers. And, and, and it's so vitally important in our spiritual life because if you just pray and then you ain't getting your prayers answered, then you're wasting your time. The seven keys for directional prayer. We said, number one, repentance. We've got to check ourselves before we go up into God's presence. We've got to check ourselves and we've got to really make sure that um, we've had that wonderful radical change and, and we've got to make sure that, that we're in right standing with God because God is a holy God. Yeah. And number two is rejoicing. We, 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 we have a, 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 a peace about us. Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, giveth I unto you. We've got to have that peace in knowing that no matter what, we are going through God's promises cannot fail. Before I pray for people, I first have to believe in the promises that I'm praying. Yes, yes. I, have, I was sharing with some people that I've been blessed to see some of the greatest miracles take place. I don't know why or how. And <laughs> I've seen from the blind eyes open, literally. I've seen... God miraculously make the deaf hear. I've seen God cause tumors to drop. It's amazing where people's minds be. <laughs> you know, the lady at the back of the crusade when they brought her, and I laid hands on her, and she was miraculously healed, and the tumor dropped. I always share with you that what was more amazing, I mean, not more, but equally amazing to me, it was not just the fact that God healed this lady miraculously, but it was the people asking me, where the tumor gone? <laughs> Who cares where the tumor gone? The tumor gone. Right. Some people can ask some of the stupidest questions. questions. And I guess it's that little wicked streak in past. I always tell people, 
when people ask you stupid questions, give them stupid answers. Now, that's not biblical, so don't quote me on that. That's just, that's just okay, call it a flaw in your pastor. But I, I just believe stupid questions deserve stupid answers. You know, and of course, other people would counsel you and say, no, if they may just genuinely be ignorant. They may not know, but there are some questions that are really, really stupid. Yeah. And of course, for you teachers, the only stupid, I, I don't know if y'all really believe this, but y'all tell people, the only stupid question is the one that you don't ask. <laughs> now, y'all teachers, y'all know better than that. <laughs> I mean, that sounds good. Don't get me wrong. That Y'all just go, y'all continue telling people that. That's wonderful. Bless the Lord. So, so you got to have that rejoicing. And that rejoicing, when you feel with the spirit, man, you, you, you have that rejoicing. And you know that when you pray, you believe the promises of God and you expect to see things happen, no matter what it looks like. And that's why, you know, this morning when they put... Uh, Brother on the in law on the on the ambulance, we had that peace and we had that comfort. I said he's going in God's hands. Yeah. Yeah, now, of course, melodramatic people would, would want to stop right in the middle and say, "Oh, bless God!" They want and get in the middle and the way of them paramedics and, and, and say, "Bless God, we can have a prayer. We gonna have a prayer meeting right here. Hold, tell the paramedics to hold on." And that that that, <laughs> that make no sense. Luke was a physician. You, 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 you gotta have sense with this thing. Yeah, yeah. I st I have th the promises of God are yes and amen. Yeah, and when you're filled with the Spirit, you know that the Holy Spirit is the one that accomplishes His promises. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Then you've gotta have reverence. You've got to have that reverence. That's that's missing. God is a holy God. You've got to have that respect yeah. for God. Yeah. You you've got to know that there's something bigger than you. That's what touched me with Senator McCain. One of the things that he realized is that there was something bigger than him. Some people think they're God. And some people, they act like they're God. And some people, they're so high on themselves. You know, I'm not speaking about any particular leader, so don't point no fingers at me and don't send me no mail. I'm just saying that he realized that there's something bigger than him. And if there's something bigger than you, then you could be but vapor if he decides to wipe you out. But once you realize that there's something bigger than you, you have reverence for that which is bigger and that which is greater. Because when we worship the Lord and serve him with reverence, with, with, with awe, uh, with, with, with godly fear and, and submissive wonder, then we will see God move. And then restorative. God is in this season of restoring relationships. There are a lot of broken relationships. Right now our nation is crying out from, from I'm going to be blunt, from, from a serious release of racism. This, ra this nation has been torn apart, and I'm not pointing fingers at where it came from. I'm just saying we've got to deal with that, that spirit of racism that is all through our country. And the same way God is going to move with a restorative spirit of relationship building. He's going to move in our interpersonal relationships with families, with, with, with restoring broken relationships with spouses, with, with, with all sorts of things, mother and, 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 and children and father and children. Restorative. And with bringing peace between the Abrahamic children. And God wants us to be real, unpretentious. Because God don't need you up there faking. God wants to make sure that you are what you say you are and that you represent, you know. He rather you say, man, pray for, pray for, my, pray, pray for my pastor. Pray that my faith will, in, I'll activate my faith to a greater level. Never pray for your faith to increase because God will give you trials so you can exercise your faith. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you got to be wise with God because God, God operates in a particular way and then regularity some of our brothers and sisters of the Abrahamic faiths they, they have set times that they pray and religiously and I'm not going to knock them all I'm saying is that w when you realize that, that every breath belongs to God yeah. then you don't need to 
you don't need to go to any particular place. You don't need to put nothing uh, on to pray. You don't even need to, to count beads. You, you could pray just by closing your eyes. You can pray by shutting out the world and going before God and saying, God, this is your child. I need you. I need you. I need you right now in this situation. It is a regular thing, the same way where you talk regularly to people that, that, that are real to you. The, the, one of the prayers I had for our children when they were in their mother's stomach, I said, God, let these children have a relationship with you that is as real as their relationship with their parents. And that way they'll realize that they don't need to come with all formality, O oh, thou grand universal deity, sit thou upon the supreme circle of the earth and encompass us within thy benevolence. No, no, no. You, should you just come and say, Daddy, it's rough <laughs> right now, but I need you to move on my behalf. You could say that. You could have a re You could pray, and some people call this flaky. You could pray for a parking space. You could literally pray, God cares about our every need. You can go, I've seen this happen. You can go in a crowded place and, and say, um, Jesus, I need a parking space. And it happens all the time. Now, mind you, you've got to operate the law of reciprocity, too. Because, you know, with this crazy traffic we got in this city, you could pray for God to give you a break, especially when you're battling the time of the clock to get where you need to be. You could pray for God to, to, to let you get a break in traffic. But you know what I found works for me? The law of reciprocity. When you let some people out, don't mind them, because you got some mean and ungrateful people. You, they, you let them out, and you, I, I got over this years ago. You let them out, and you, you expect them to say, Boop, Mom, thank you. You let them out, and they look at you as, as if you should have stopped earlier. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, God delivered me from anger and traffic. Because, you know, that used to really tick me off. I said, my God, I stop. And the people behind me probably cussing. I stop. And the per I mean, they just do like, you You had to do that anyway because I'm here. <laughs> you know, that, that, could, that could really get your goat. Um, and then, of course, responsive. That's where we are this morning. Two-way street. God wants to answer back. Wait on him. As we have focused on the seventh point, which is, responsive prayer we've gone to Gethsemane at the point right after Christ had finished those agonizing moments there speaking with his father over the the supremacy of his will and 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 left the seclusion of that spot and that spiritual place and he came to the disciples and, and he found them sleeping and he said to Peter so you men could not stay awake and keep watch with me for one hour. Keep actively watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Sister Army, get ready to read for me. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 to 13. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 to 13. Now, in the first part of this message, we have focused on the importance of making sure that what we are praying is truly God's will for our life because it's, it's, it's so much better to be in his perfect will because when we allow ourselves to be in his permissive will, what he permits, not what is his ideal will, when we allow ourselves to be in his permissive will, we will not, we will not reap the full blessing that God, through his infinite wisdom, has decreed to occur or our behalf, as God revealed to us through the prophet Jeremiah. Sister Omi. Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. Amen. For I know the plans and the thoughts that I have for you, says the Lord. 
plans for peace and well-being and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call on me and you will come and pray to me and I will hear your voice and I will listen to you. Then with a deep longing, you will seek me and mm. require me as a vital necessity mm. and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. And after going a little further, he, Yeshua, fell face down and prayed saying, my father, if it is possible that is consistent with your will let this cup pass from me yet not as I will but as you will in the first part of my message we focused on the cup that Christ in his humanity and, and with the exercise of his own will asked for the father to let pass from him. Christ cried out in agony the tears of his humanity, but quickly reasoned within himself and made his question into a rhetorical one, one that answers itself, yet not as I will, but as you will. Mm. That cup represents our being strengthened to be overcomers when we are going through these times of challenge regardless of, of, of what valley or, 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 or shadow they cast and are being strong enough to, 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 to yield to the sovereignty of a good God because God is a good God that in his omniscience is all wisdom and with his omnibenevolent all good nature has plans for our peace and plans for our well-being and, and not for our disaster. It makes no difference what you're facing. It, it may seem like a disaster, but God does not plan for our disaster. He has plans to give us a future and a hope. Amen? So, so we have covered the following three very important points under responsive prayer. Number one, we have to make sure that what we are praying is really God's will for our life. We have to make sure that what we are praying is really God's will for our life. Number two, our prayer must line up with God's word. Our prayer must line up with God's word. Because as John 15 and 7 tells us, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So uh, for this to happen, for us to see this happen, our prayers must line up with God's word. Amen? Amen? And point number three. Point number three. We cannot pray with wrong motives. So many people pray with their own agenda, not God's agenda. We cannot pray with wrong wrong motives we've got to remove self out of the equation we've got to say father what is your will now sometimes when we ask god what his will is it could get a little scary but we still have got to trust in an omnibenevolent and all good god that whatever his will is that the steps of a righteous man will be ordered by the lord and that God has an excellent plan for us beyond our expectation. Amen? James 4 and 3 tells us, this is from the Amplified. You ask God for something and do not receive it because you ask with wrong motives, out of selfishness, or with an unrighteous agenda. It's like praying see how I can put this. It's like praying for God to put wrong people in um, the right position. <laughs> Whatever that 
right position is or wh whoever the wrong person is. That, that is outside of God's will. You can't mix and dabble this with that. The Bible is not a multiple choice uh, experience. You cannot have wrong motives. So that when you get what you want, you may spend it on your hedonistic desires. A lot of people, they ask God to, to make them rich so they could live large. Robin Leach just died. We used to love to watch him. It's not a lifestyles of the rich and famous. It's not a sin to have wealth and to be rich. But if you've got your agenda to be rich just so you could live large and just so you can zip around in, in jets and, and, and say, it's all for the kingdom, brother. <laughs> That's the wrong motive. I don't care who it is. But if you see currency, it's a trick with currency. Currency has to flow just like current. God will get it to you if God can get it through you. If you then ask God to bless you so you can be a blessing, then that's the right motive. That's just an example in the simple and in the natural. You cannot have wrong motives. And you cannot justify your sinful pleasures under the banner of God. Now my fourth point under responsive prayer that also comes from the Garden of Gethsemane, which means oil press, is the phrase that Christ admonished his disciples to do on several occasions, even in addition to Gethsemane, and that is to watch and pray. Watch and pray. That's a loaded statement. And I can tell you it's going to be a two-part, I'm going to handle the first part this Sunday. Watch and pray. <laughs> we have to keep actively watching and praying that we may not come into temptation. Because, because the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Watch and pray. This was made famous long before Tyler Perry's movies. Watch and pray. <laughs> Christ right in this statement to his inner circle because remember he didn't carry all of them in his inner circle of apostles he had just revealed so much that we so often tend to just pass right over and, and I will not do the injustice of rushing right over this watch and, and pray the, the first thing that we have to establish here is that this is a message of both literal and figurative significance. As, as Christ wakes his sleeping disciples in the natural, sleep is a biological necessity for our central nervous system to rest and for us to achieve what they call REM, rapid eye movement. That's where you dream. Sleep where we dream. E e e even in the state of rest uh, of sleep, it can be a medium of spiritual significance and, and spiritual influence as, as many that have fallen into a comatose state. Have, they've given powerful testimony to hearing the world that's around them even while they've been in a comatose state. Uh, they have given powerful testimony that while they sleep, They've heard their loved ones on the outside speaking God's word, speaking the scripture to them, speaking to their spiritual being. Scripture tells us that God uses our sleep on occasion to give us revelatory dreams and to give us guidance. Stairs, get ready to read for me Luke chapter 21, verses 34 to 36. Now, the, the, the Baker's Evangelical Dictionary tells us that the word sleep is also used metaphorically of spiritual dullness, sloth, or lack of watchfulness. Yeshua, Jesus, took Peter, James, and John with him to the Garden of Gethsemane with a significance of their role being one for the body of Christ to be watchmen. 
for the significance of the prophetic hour as we see that he used this same phrase earlier in his ministry in a context that really expounds our role as watchmen. There's Luke chapter 21 verses 34 to 36. Be on your guard so that your hearts are not weighed down and depressed with the giddiness of the debauchery and the nausea of self-indulgence and the worldly worries of life. And then that day when the Messiah returns will not come on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon you, those who live in the face of the earth, but keep alert at all times. Be attentive and ready, praying that you may have the strength and the ability to be found worthy and to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand in the presence of the Son of Man at his coming. Watch and pray. Christ's warning here is very clear and needs <laughs> no great expounding. He wants us to stop being worldly, to stop being self-indulgent believers that are so caught up with the worries and pleasures of this life that we would even miss him when he comes, because he's coming back, saints. We have to be committed, saints. Not sometimey or, or wishy-washy. Uh, thank God for everyone that's here this morning. But people, we live in a world now where people think that they can just pop into church. Let me just give God a little visit. God ain't... If I was to... When I was driving here this morning, I said, you know, um, they'd probably keep, they'd probably cast pastor out of, of, of honorable circles, but I'm sure God at some point in time would like to play a, a song to the church from the world called Part-Time Lover. God ain't looking for part-time lovers. <laughs> the same way we don't want part-time lovers. God ain't looking for no part-time lovers. Where you just, you know, well, I got nothing better to do. <laughs> you know, I, oh, God, I've got to go to church. I'm tired. Some people, they, they just think they can just pop and do God a favor. They don't realize who they serve. That's why I say reverence. If you really, really know who you serve and what he can do, we wouldn't have part time lovers. <laughs> And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not stay awake and keep watch with me for one hour. My God. One of the most profound things about the ministry of God's word is that the infinite potency of its revelation will only be unveiled to you when you are where you are supposed to be within his will. As Christ explained this to his own disciples, we were, were left bewildered by his parabolic style. Now stay with me. Stay with me. And when he was alone with them, away from the crowds, he explained to them why he spoke in Parables. I'm reading this from Mark chapter 4, verses 11 to 12. The mystery of the kingdom of God has been given to you who have teachable hearts. Some people, they don't have a teachable heart. And if you don't have a teachable heart, God cannot give you instructions. You got to humble yourself. You've got to say, I do not know everything. Some people, they think they know more than, <laughs> more than generals. Some people think they know more, than, they know more than, than, than the professors in universities. You've got to humble yourself. 
if you want God to impart revelation to you. The mystery of the kingdom of God has been given to you who have teachable hearts. But to those who are outside, the unbelievers, the spiritually blind, <laughs> get everything, they get everything in parables so that they will continually look but not see. And they will continually hear, but not understand. Otherwise, they might turn from the rejection of the truth and be forgiven. And he came to his disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not stay awake and keep watch with me for one our those that are actively involved in the service of intercession will truly appreciate this as one of the foundational scriptures for intercessory spiritual warfare in particular uh, as it has been organized into the eight prayer watches with each watch Focused on a different purpose. You see, you see, in, in Yeshua's time, the natural mind would think that the purpose for the prayer in the garden would, would, would only have been for Christ and his disciples to, to once again evade their pursuers. And, and, and that was why Simon Peter he chopped off Malchus's heir after Judas betrayed Jesus. But 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 the real focus of intercession was not found <laughs> in the natural. The real focus of intercession was not the natural, but a supernatural battle <laughs> that, that was taking place between good and evil. And see, you got to see this because many of us have been trying to fight natural battles without taking it up to the spirit spiritual dimension you've got to, to get dressed for warfare when it starts to get rough it's because God's purpose is, is starting to be fulfilled and you're going to have to fight hell and his demons sometimes as Satan made another visit to tempt the Lord the, the first recorded one being in the Judean desert as Matthew 4 Verses 1 to 2 tells us that Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. This is the Judean desert. To be tempted by the devil. After he had gone without food for 40 days. And 40 nights he became hungry. I need a reader. Get ready to read for me Ephesians chapter 5 verses 4. 14 to 16. Ephesians 5, 14 to 16. Now, uh, unless we get the right focus and discernment in our prayer life and intercession, we will always fall asleep with spiritual dullness, sloth. In other words, feel a reluctance to, to do it or want to make a genuine effort because intercession can... A lot of people are not called to be intercessors. It's a discipline. We will always lack the watchfulness that God desires unless we get the right focus and discernment in our prayer life. And it will make no difference how often or early you pray. All things become visible when they are exposed by the light of God's precepts. For it is light that makes everything visible. Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 14 to 16. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that um, sleepest, hmm. and arise from the dead, hmm. and Christ shall give thee light. Mm -hmm. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but hmm. as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Hmm. So, 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 so the real focus of intercession 
was not the natural, but a supernatural battle that was taking place between good and evil. Christ took Peter, James, and John with him to a place named Gethsemane, and as the Living Bible puts it, he began to be filled with horror and deepest distress. Mark 14, 33 to 35. He took Peter, James, and John with him and began to be filled with horror and deepest distress. And he said to them, My soul is crushed by sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. He went on a little further and fell to the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might never come. <laughs> there is a diverse array of interpretations of this particular scripture and a difference in opinion of our biblical scholars with regards to whether this was a temptation of Christ, like the one in the Judean wilderness, or whether Christ's agonizing moments were just simply a matter of him wrestling within his own self over what was foreordained to take place. Here we have the only begotten Son of God and, and the Son of Man existing in hypostatic union, which is the theological term for his dual nature. He was fully God and he was fully man. But for our redemption, he would have to carry his cross down the Via Dolorosa to his crucifixion at Calvary and our redemption, but, but, but all in his humanity. Hmm. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. Just, just, just like in the Judean wilderness, Satan's temptation was for Christ to unduly exercise his divine sonship, which would, would in the, the, the first case, have left us powerless over sin as through his overcoming it, atonement was made since we, God's children, are human beings made of flesh and blood. He became flesh and blood. <laughs> I need another reader. Get ready to read for me. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. He became like us. We're flesh and blood. He became flesh and blood. By being born into a human form, he was conceived by the Holy Ghost and born of the Virgin Mary. <laughs> Amen. For only as a human being could he die and in dying then break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Be 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 because God, the Almighty, broke the power of death, hell, and the grave by being born of the Virgin Mary and by coming in the flesh and by being victorious. Hebrews. As we all know, he, Christ, does not take hold <laughs> of the fallen mm. angels. That's the Amplified to give them a helping hand. Uh -huh. But he does take hold of the fallen descendants of Abraham, of Abraham <laughs> extending to them his hand of deliverance. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it was essential that he had to be made like his brothers. All right. 
mankind yes. in every respect so that he might <laughs> by experience become a merciful yes, yes, and yes. faithful high priest mm -hmm. in things related to God mm -hmm. to make atonement <laughs> propitiation for the people's sin thereby wiping away the sin yes. satisfying divine mm -hmm. justice and providing a way of reconciliation between God and mankind. Oh, you ought to give God the glory. Because God has made a way when there seemed to be no way. He is the bridge. Oh, I thank God for Jesus. So, so the real focus of intercession is not the natural, but a supernatural battle that is taking place between good and evil yes. all things become visible when they are exposed by the light of god's precepts for it is light that makes everything visible so so touch a neighbor and say neighbor, neighbor. Turn, on turn on the light <laughs> there are some errant teachings around today coming equally from the scientific minds as from certain churches that believe that demonic oppression and, and demonic possession can be explained away as fictional, self-delusion, historical, and even as the incubus phenomenon. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is that demonic warfare is increasing today at alarming rates. And intellectuals and scientists, they are, will all be powerless to do anything about it before you can even get to that point. Saints, we must be sober. We must be watchful. As First Peter 5 and 8 puts it, our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. I always tell people I add my little behemoth version, let's see. But Jesus done knock out all he teeth. <laughs> I'm under the rock and the rock is higher than I. Jehovah hide me. I'm under the rock. I will continue this message on the reality of demonic warfare and influence for our watchmen. But this morning I want to end with praying that the light of God's precepts will make all things visible for us with regards to what we are facing and with regards to what we are fighting. <laughs> Whether it be the demonic influence or possession of, of, of other people in our lives because, let's face it, we live in a world now where we got some demon-filled people in our lives. As Second Corinthians, or even in your situations, as Second Corinthians 2 and 11 tells us that Satan can only take advantage of us if we are ignorant to his devices, which means his weapons and his schemes. So we got to turn on the light. That's what I'm going to be talking about next in my next message. So get ready for spiritual warfare. My prayer, though, this morning, is that the light of God's precepts will make all things visible for us with regards to, to what we are facing and fighting with because the, the real focus of intercession is, is not the natural, but the supernatural battle. The real focus is, is it, it's easy to, to, to come and, and pray, we you know, in the natural because... Some people, they, they, they have the most eloquent words. And trust me, I, I've come from the Episcopalian church. They, they, they have the most eloquent words, but let me tell you something. When you really get busy fighting and chasing demons, 
You don't have time to be all po polite. Pardon me. You don't have time to tell the demon it would be immediately um, mandatory for you to expel thyself. Um, you ain't got time for that. You only thing you got time to do is lay hands and speak. Yeah. And what you do when you fight in warfare? I'm, I'm, I'm gonna teach you some stuff. Next message is is you 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 lay hands. The battle is eye to eye. The demon will listen to your authority. Don't worry about all them flowery words and the north. <laughs> <laughs> you lay hands, you take authority, and you cast that bugger out. And pastor did not curse. Bugger is not a bad word. Some people they out there, they're so flaky, you know. They, they, oh my God, he said bugger. Bugger is just a, 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 a term for a, a non-invited guest. You cast him out, you take authority in Jesus' name, and turn the light on in your situations. A lot of the battles that you're fighting, they are not natural battles. You'll, you'll see the people. You'll see the, the devious people around you that, that come to cause distraction and, and come to, to frustrate you and come to, to take your place and, and to destroy you. But realize, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Even on the national level. This is not a natural battle. Hear me well. This on the national basis, is not a natural battle. It's a spiritual battle. And the reason why, I'm just going to be honest with you, the reason why Pastor gets so excited sometimes when talking about things that are going on in our time is because I can see what Satan is doing. So turn on the light. Every situation you face, whatever it is, turn on the light. And once the light is on, you'll see all the roaches. <laughs> roaches don't like to operate in the light, you know. Roaches, they, they man, they have a field day. <laughs> I sometimes they imagine they having a conga line. Hey! Hey, Macarena! You, you got you got your... <laughs> Pastor been up too early. Please forgive me. <laughs> Turn on the light. In Jesus' name.